uh, begins with my biological orientation. If God is perfect, omnibenevolent, omniscient, omnipotent, so on and so forth, and humans are created in God's image, how do you explain seeming imperfection in the design of Homo sapiens, such as the lower back I mentioned earlier, knees and hips, which could use more cartilage, <laughs> and the <laughs> ocular nerve punching through the front of the retina rather than exiting out of the back. <laughs> I don't know much about the retina issues, but I know there's a few different sides on it, but uh, it, it, certainly there are imperfections in the uh, in this world. I mean, it's part of the general problem of evil is what you're bringing up. You could go a lot further than that. You could talk about earthquakes and tsunamis and, and I could add to your list almost endlessly. Um, not to mention moral evil. Uh, people doing things that are cruel to other people and so on. Um, I, in, this, in this particular question, I think it actually requires a particularly Christian approach. Um, for one thing, Christians believe that this universe has, has fallen into rebellion against God and under a curse. And that we expect this world to be full of suffering and, and misery in connection with that. Um, the story is told in Genesis chapter 3 of the, of the fall of the human race and the results of that. Uh, beyond that, though, there's still the issue of if God's the reconciliation of evil with God's omnibenevolence, God's goodness. Um, I would argue that there's good reason to believe that God is omnibenevolent, that he desires the happiness of all and not the suffering of beings in general, as I laid out in the opening statement. However, I do not believe that it can be proven that God could not, for a good purpose, for a benevolent purpose ultimately, ordain evil things to exist for that good purpose, not for their own sake, not for the sake of the suffering and evil in enjoyment of those things, but it, it, as part of a larger whole, and that evil and suffering can fit into a, a larger picture that is ultimately the best, the best thing, even though the evils are definitely in themselves evil. Uh, I would assert that that is certainly, I, would, I believe that's the case. I think that's logically defensible, and I do not think there's any uh, coherent argument Prove that that could be the case, and therefore I don't believe there's a contradiction between God's omnibenevolence and the imperfections and evil of the world. A major component of your argument for the existence of God was that um, that what we call consciousness or mentality or, or the psychological properties. Um, are not derivable from matter. And that therefore, there must be an explanation or a source of consciousness, mentation, psychological properties, and that we call God. Um, that, however, is based on a mechanistic view of nature that we were hand we've been handed down um, from Descartes and others that nature is a machine, that nature chugs along according to the mechanistic properties of, of physics in a deterministic, mathematical, predictable way, and that by definition, because of the determinism of nature, you can't get something like a consciousness or ment mentality, which is indeterministic, right? The, sor the source of free will. Um, why is it not possible that the me mechanistic view of nature is false and that the fundamental constituents, the, the fundamental units of nature are comprised of both physicality and mentality, monads, if you will, because on that model, you can explain both psych, uh, mentality and physicality from the fundamental constitution of nature 
without needing to defer to a source outside of nature, such as God. I'm not sure I fully understand what you just said. But it sounds like, I mean, you, it sounds like you're assuming that uh, just basically that mind is a fundamental part of nature. That, that's right. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have to say, well, well how, how is that? I do believe that mind is fundamental to, to the universe, obviously. Um, I just don't think that it can be reduced to material uh, phenomena. In other words, what we call matter, we look at the brain, we see, uh, we see what we call matter operating there. We see material causes, matter and energy, um, complex patterns of matter being formed, animated complex patterns, because there's neurons firing and things moving around in there. Um, what I'm arguing is that you cannot get to consciousness, to mind, from those sorts of processes. That, that there's something irreducible about the uh, concept of, of mind, about what mind is, what consciousness is. There's something irreducible there, and that therefore you're not going to be able to reduce it to something else. It's going to go all the way back to the first cause, and therefore the first cause will possess consciousness. Um, I do believe there's a close connection between matter and, and mind, but I do not believe that the one can be reduced to the other at a lot of time. A lot of modern neuroscientists uh, view the situation. Well, let, a follow up question then. Asserting that the mind is not reducible to matter, as you have, especially in your cannonball illustration, it, it's, the way that I interpret it is, is akin to saying that there is an independence of mind and matter. They, they might coexist and there might be relationships between them, but there is some fundamental difference, independence between the two. But why is it, why should we um, reject the evidence of, of modern neurophysiology to suggest that there is an intimate connection between psychics, psychological state and physical state? When people are depressed, we give them antidepressants. Um, when they have a brain injury, they experience uh, dementia. Um, uh, as some of us age, we, our personality seems to change. If, if mentality was independent fundamentally from physical processes, it, it seems to me that the, the, the physical structure, the physical character of the brain could change and that our psychological properties wouldn't. But the opposite is the case. So it seems to me that the two properties are fundamentally unified and not independent. Why, why, why should I uh, not be convinced of that? Yeah. Um, well, I think we have to use the independent in two different ways here. Be careful. I don't assert that, they are, is, that mind is independent in the sense of necessarily that there's empirical evidence that is separable from, well, I do believe that it's separable in some sense, but I do, in this world, I don't believe that the mind is independent of matter in the sense of being unaffected by it or entirely separate from it. Independent in the sense of being a different thing, being, simply being something different than what matter is. I think what modern neuroscience and uh, what people have known before modern neuroscience as well, is that obviously there's an intrinsic interrelationship that in this life is basically unbreakable between mind and matter. Yeah, so, so, so drugs affect our consciousness. We fall asleep. That has, or you, can, you can register people's emotions. You can see different brain patterns, off, different things, neurons firing, different thoughts, and, and so on. Um, definitely, I think that's true. But all that proves is that there is a, an interrelationship between them. They're tied together. They work together. They have a symbiotic relationship almost in this life. But yet, it, it doesn't prove that they are the same thing or that mind is reducible to matter. Uh, and I think there are good reasons, like the cannibal illustration was meant to illustrate, for thinking that they are not the same thing. And that's why we go with that. Okay, I get asked a personal question uh, since you asked me one. What is wrong with living life without the idea that there is an overarching, transcendent purpose to your existence above and beyond being a character 
in an, in an evolutionary play? I would say there is absolutely nothing wrong with believing what you believe if it were true.
perceptions of them on our senses. In other words, their effects on our senses. A lot of people in philosophically will talk about there being some kind of substance out there that then creates an effect on our senses. So they have two fundamentally different things. And that brings up the question you raised, which is how do you, if, if you can't get matter from consciousness, how are you going to get, or if you can't get, uh, if you can't get consciousness from matter, how are you going to get matter from consciousness? How is, how is a God who is consciousness and presumably immaterial also going to bring about the existence of matter? I would argue that matter, uh, and it's hard to trace out this to a full argument here, but my, my position is similar to that of George Berkeley, that the, the uh, nature of matter is ultimately a mode of mind, and ultimately God's mind, uh, in the end, as opposed to being an absolutely dualistic, separate substance. So I would argue that mind is the foundation, and the matter is the mode of that, ultimately, as opposed to matter, as we normally conceive it, being a foundation, and mind coming from that. I know I have a lot to say. You can ask me questions about it, but that's how we might be answer. I would like to see more arguments in that regard. Mark, the direction you're going, that I find perhaps could be self defeating for you, I will go more in the idealistic, monistic position rather than a Christian position. Uh, I cannot get into that at this point. Uh, again, it's a lot of time. But Berkeley, of course, is a very questionable uh, person. So I don't believe that we should simply bring in one uh, authority or person or philosopher from the tradition and, and then say that that's it. You know, he said you can't say it at all. Anyway, the second uh, related question to that. Your idea of telos, uh, a purpose, theology, that comes only when the first cause is, is established. That was, that, that's your point, I believe, because without that, we don't need to have this idea of telos. Okay, if that be the case, uh, then David's question mm, uh, uh, was that if we can, from that telos, uh, first cause get uh, an only benevolent God, then why the superabundance of bad things, even in this world, why right? couldn't it be not less, if anything, at all, if that God, the Creator could be anything at all, and if that God was caring, then of course there would be a lack of evil in this world, or perhaps a lot of less evil. Now one response truly would be, as we get it, which is that the idea of a world that is, that contains evil is consistent with the idea of benevolence. Uh, because the world is not a perfect world, it's the best possible world, perhaps, uh, which is uh, which makes the opposition consistent with the idea of benevolence. Now, I find that idea to be problematic, not only just to me, but I can speak for myself. Uh, and the reason is this. Uh, of course, we say that God gave us free will and all that, and as a result, God could have made this world just perfect. The problem with God is all powerful, all good, but it didn't, because God has a lot of us, and he believes that it's better to have a world in which human beings learn from their mistakes by exercising the free will than otherwise. It's one of the many ways we try to make that distinction clear between a perfect world where there is no evil, but still perhaps it's not all that desirable, it's perhaps the best possible world that we should go for, and the best possible world is consistent with having some evil in it. But the problem is this this idea of the best possible world is not falsifiable. Things that doesn't matter how Ever bad the world is, he will hold on to almost a dogmatic idea. Wow, if God was not a evil person, now, now when it gets to that point, then we are departing from reason and rationality, getting into dogma and faith. Again, it's a question of making the uh, issue that I raised earlier, so I'm following that path. Since now you are getting into a series of circularity, then the question is, which is presuming. Uh, something and then it, uh, based on the presumption trying to defend yourself, I mean the presumption in your confusion, you know. So that's the problem, that the idea of the best possible world uh, is not falsifiable, that's maps of faith and dogma, and if you try to show that that's based on reason, then uh, there is this circularity. <coughs> yeah, I cannot uh, prove empirically or philosophically just the reasoning that this is the best possible world, obviously not. I, I just, I'm too limited in my understanding, as we all are, as human beings, to be able to do that. My point in, in asserting that, in talking about that subject, though, is, is because the problem of evil, basically, it's arguing that the existence and the prevalence of evil in the world is inconsistent, is contradictory to 
the existence of a non benevolent being. In other words, that there's something about there being too much evil or, or the wrong kind of it or something of that sort that says that, well, now that you've got this much evil in it, or whatever, you cannot, it can't be reconciled. It shows a contradiction, that there's no way a good God could ordain these things for a good purpose. My, my point is to say, I would agree, it's in a sense what, what you hold on that in itself with, is not able, you can't reason from one or the other just by looking around you. Um, but that's my point. There, can, there is not been a, there is no argument, there is no proof that there is a contradiction between the, uh, the existence of evil, the amount of evil, the kind of evil in the world, and the existence of an omnipotent God who ordains all things for a good purpose. So there is no there is no contradiction that has been shown between those two. So therefore, it is perfectly consistent of me to believe in the universe as it is with the evil that exists and believe in an omnipotent being. And that's therefore reasonable. And that's therefore reasonable if there's other good reasons for believing in an omnipotent being, which I believe there is, which I believe not. There is another question, the fact that it's not contradictory. You know? Of course it's not, it's consistent, but at what price do you get, do you gain this consistency? At the prices are correct, that's my point. So you get these two parts of the dilemma. It is contradictory, and you can get out of it by holding that distinction between the perfect world and the best possible world, and we're caught into the circular. So it's your choice, either way, you are stuck. That is the point I was trying to make. So I agree with you, yes, no consistency. No consistency, but at all price. Okay, very quickly, uh, one point I must raise uh, in that area of telos, not the first cause, which is the idea of purpose and morality. Uh, Mark, uh, uh, the question is this uh, you said that without uh, your God, the Christian, when I was a Christian, God, morality cannot be made sense of. Then, because we are starting with this world as you have done, looking around based on intuitive ideas and then from there try to bring in reason, if we look around, we find that both in the East and in the West, in the Eastern world and in the Western world, morality triumphed all along without God, in fact, uh, without God, in fact, in spite of God. Let me give you some examples. In the Eastern world, the two most important sources of morality happen to be, but three, four maybe, uh, I can list a lot more, Theravada Buddhism, where there is no mention of God, or Confucianism, which is purely humanistic, or Yoga, where God is brought in as a therapeutic, playful device, uh, not really a, an actuality. And those get in the Eastern world, the Eastern world, and I always of course, not an example, you know, not a Christian God and personal principle, but not an anthropomorphic being, create traditions and directions of their morality. In the Western world as well, uh, we find the ancient world, if we start with the Greeks, no mention of Christianity, of course, that all happened before Jesus, and they did not base their morality on God. What they get us is more psychology, which we could call virtue ethics. Come to modern world, uh, past the medieval times when God came in, and in the modern world, the two most important modern theories are deontology and utilitarianism, and they don't have any God there either. Plus, in the area of statecraft, morality in the area of statecraft, which we call justice, morality in the area of statecraft is justice, for that we have the US Constitution. What a wonderful guide to moral way of uh, handling uh, uh, matters of state. Uh, and uh, the Constitution is the most secular document that I know of. No mention of religion, no mention of Christianity, or whatever. So, when you have it so adequately served, when it comes to morality, without any mention of God, and when God is brought in in the Abrahamic tradition, where morality and God led us to countless millions of death in the name of God, I find it a bit counterintuitive because we're giving an intuitive uh, intuition as the starting point. Why are you making the point that you can't have morality without God? Unless you can give us very convincing reasons that I haven't seen yet. Forgive me for a tough question like this I'm going on, but as I said, to, to respect uh, the positions, we have to also respect that with tough questions. So I have two questions there. The first, the first one basically is, if you need God for morality, then why are there good people in the world who don't believe in God? Why are there, why is morality taught in traditions that don't have a belief in a, a Christian or a, a Judeo?
Judeo-Christian concept of God. Um, there's a few different points to make here. One, I do believe that all people have an intuition of that, that, that ethics exist, that there is such a thing as moral responsibility. People sense that this is true. People don't always, don't always deal with, their, with these intuitions uh, rationally and, and uh, consistently. However, a lot of any worldview is going to have to deal with reality. And therefore, even a worldview that doesn't have a foundation for something might still affirm its existence. You know, for example, I don't think atheism has a foundation to believe in the existence of anything because there's no explanation. But yet, obviously, atheists do believe in people and chairs and trees and so on, but they have no foundation for doing so. Similarly, many philosophies will teach that there is an objective ethical obligation, and yet they don't have a foundation for it. They hold it because they know that it's got to be true, but they don't have any explanation for it in their system. Um, another point to make here is that there is a difference between there, – there is, there is some aspect of ethics that can be maintained apart from God, such as there are consequences – assuming you grant the existence of things in the general universe without God, which I don't, but for the sake of argument. Um, if you live in this world, you have to deal with the laws of physics. You have to deal with the laws of social interaction, and you can't, you can't be happy living any way that you want. So there's obviously going to be a basis, like many philosophers have pointed out, for restraining yourself, for not killing people. It doesn't make you very popular, get you advanced in life, people around murdering everybody you see, right? So that's, that's pretty obvious. Uh, so you're going, there's going to be motivations coming purely from selfish considerations or just or other human desires like sympathy that will lead to some ethical behavior. Um, some, sometimes ethics means that, means basically prudence in behavior. Some of the ancient Greeks even used it that way, as well as the modern people. And in that sense, I grant that to some extent you can account for prudence apart from God, again, granting the existence of anything. What you cannot ground apart from God, though, is the existence of moral obligation in the sense that there is something that I am supposed to do. I have a duty, not just I have desires and how do I best fulfill them, but I actually have a duty to do something. There's something I'm supposed to be. There's something I'm supposed to do. Some moral obligation outside of my desires that gives me an ideal that I'm supposed to live up to. That, I do not believe you can have apart from God because there is no objective value in the universe. Um, so sometimes the terminology is confusing. I think sometimes it refers to just basically prudence in that sense to some degree, but not sufficiently, I think it can exist. Uh, in other worldviews, and sometimes it refers to moral responsibility, in which case I don't believe it can exist at all. Also, even people in the world, in other religions, some of them will might be ethical partly because they believe in the existence of ethics, so they have no foundation for it. Other people might behave well because of considerations of prudence, which I would ultimately consider non-ethical motivation for behaving well in the end, but certainly something that's available to anybody who lives on Earth and has to deal with laws of physics and laws of social We don't need to believe in God. 
Now, just because we don't need to believe in God in the sense that we can explain our universe uh, in a, in a more concise fashion without believing in the God hypothesis, that in itself does not show that God does not exist. Uh, so I was hoping we can go a bit beyond that to show that even though we don't need God, perhaps maybe God is still there. Uh, by that, by the way, I'm saying even though we don't need God for explanatory reasons, perhaps God is still there. Uh, and uh, explanatory need is not the only thing to move, okay? Our only way to show that something cannot be there beyond it. So, can you give us something that's either empiricistic or a priori, the way, for example, David proceeded to show uh, in what way in the demanding claim that David is making that the Abrahamic God is indeed the first God. It's very many because that God has to exactly the way it has been laid out in Christianity, in the tradition. Uh, all powerful, all knowing, all good, uh, is both personal as well as transcendental, is both real and supernatural. Uh, along with that, God comes to hell, heaven, those ideas and angels, a whole area of uh, belief, you know. Uh, and the more demanding the claim is, the harder it can defend it. In response to that, how did it went? You did not go far enough, and if you don't, how do you still mention the fact that we don't uh, rationally uh, need to believe in God? Uh, um, how can you maintain your uh, atheism based on what you did? This is what we le love about Dean Chatterjee, always pushing our limits and forcing us to go a step beyond the conclusion that we felt comfortable uh, arriving at. Uh, I'm an empiricist. I believe that the starting point of knowledge is concrete, tangible experience. So is Mark. Um, that, that is why we, we make um, good interlocutors in this kind of discussion because we both like to start with what is observable in our everyday lives. From that point, we go in different directions. Um, there is no evidence that I have ever seen in my life that a anthropomorphic, caring being cares about me or intervenes or has anything whatsoever to do with my life or the lives of those of the people around me who I love and care about. Like the best of all possible worlds hypothesis, um, there is no way to prove that a supernatural being does not exist. Uh, to do that, I feel I would need to be uh, omnipotent and omniscient myself. And I am a, a human being rooted in spatio-temporal earthly existence, so what I can do to the best of my ability is assess the evidence at my disposal. I see no evidence whatsoever for a personalistic Abrahamic God. The God of deism, the God of Ben Franklin and some of our the founding fathers, of, the founders of this country, uh, is a possibility. That God, as you know, created the world as a watchmaker creates a, creates a watch and disappears and wanders off to some other part of the cosmos and is completely disattached, completely unconcerned, uh, com uh, uh, devoid of any care or love for us um, and our lives and what our destiny is, whether we're saved or, or damned or whatever. Um, my atheism is based on the preponderance of evidence that I have at my disposal, which I observe from the life sciences, from biology, from ecology, the fact that Homo sapiens, the form of us, does not seem to be any pinnacle of evolution, and that we will likely go extinct and be superseded by another being, perhaps a more superior being, perhaps Nietzsche's ubermensch, uh, that, that we do not mark an endpoint of evolution. That there, there, is, there is no fossil evidence for that, that, that suddenly uh, evolution uh, 
will come to an end. And as I pointed out before, according to the science of ecology, human beings are very unimportant in the function of ecosystems. So if we have such an exalted, privileged role in the great chain of being and in, in, in the created universe, and we are created in the image of God, the evidence overwhelmingly weighs against it and suggests atheism in terms of, of the Abrahamic traditions. But just to rephrase, I can rephrase, to change Spanish line, just because you haven't found uh, the WMD and Because 
as subjective, they do not provide a good foundation for sound governmental public policy. And I threw that in my talk for a reason. Over the last five years, I believe that there is a growing, there is a growing concern that I have that public policy decisions in this great secular political framework that we have been given is being compromised by the inclusion of faith and other non-rational considerations in public discourse. Seems like you and Mark are coming rather close together because Mark has this deep and abiding respect for reason as well. In fact, that's what prompted him to take the position that he did or that he does. So in that sense, uh, it seems like you are a secular uh, humanist person uh, based on reason and you are taking the position of reason based on reason. And I think that's a very good thing point that reason perhaps can bring us together and from there we can talk about what is based on reason rather than perhaps on faith. And I don't think much to go very far from that. Given that, do you like comments? I wonder if I can make one comment. Sure. Okay. Uh, just, to be, just to clarify my own position, um, as you are defining faith, I think your definition of faith is what causes the conflict between faith and reason. I, 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 don't, uh, def I do believe in faith, but I don't define faith as believing something without any good reason. Faith is, to, faith is believing something. You can have bad faith by believing something you have no reason to believe in, or you can have good faith by believing something you do have a good reason to believe in. So I don't see faith as in the way Christians use the term faith is not the way you're using it. It's not something antithetical to reason or, or has a different source of information from reason. It's simply believing believing something. And Christians, as well as secular humanists, ideally believe in believing things on the basis of good reason as opposed to no reason or bad reason. But it's like we can we can agree there. It's just that that I would not say that that's what Christians mean by faith when you're using it. To, to come over to ask you a question. I'm sure all of you have your questions. Make them uh, very pointed and precise and very short. And let us know which uh, person would like to make a question. We have two microphones on your sides. Oh, please go over there. Okay. Um, I think the question is flawed in itself because. You cannot prove God does not exist any more than you can't prove uh, the Easter Bunny does not exist. I mean, with science, you can't prove anything does not exist. That's impossible. However, does that mean that there's a 50-50 chance? Does it mean that there's a 70-30 chance? I believe in Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, in chapter 4, he goes very well into why it is very improbable that the first cause was caused by God because of the idea of complexity. In our world, in biology, in all the science, we see um, complex things coming from simple things. We see simple things turning into complex things. We do not see some complex being coming out of nowhere and doing a very simple thing like the Big Bang. Although we don't know what caused the Big Bang, uh, we do know that it must have been something simple. It could not be something Complex. And that is why God probably does not exist when it comes to first cause. And just to answer uh, the issue of time, when did time start? Has the universe existed forever? I believe Stephen Hawking uh, says that uh, time started as we know it at the Big Bang. So anything before that uh, is not... Re relevant to time and we so have a question for you that <laughs> so, uh, so my question is, is what evidence do you have that a God caused the first cause and not something else outside of uh, morality and purpose because just because we need God to be moral does not mean he exists. Well, I was going to have a whole point of my opening statement arguments. Um, in a sense, there is a similarity this singularity that is timeless that some modern scientists accept and the first cause.
cause. But the first cause, I, I went on to argue certain aspects of the nature of that first cause, including arguments for why the first cause must possess consciousness and, and the basis of uh, love and hate and, and things of that sort. So that makes it God as opposed to some uh, non-personal thing. Does that help?
has to understand physics, string theory, quantum mechanics, and the rest, I can't answer your question. But I can say this. It's quantum mechanics and string theory that I believe is evidence of the, the falsity of the mechanical view of nature um, handed down to us from Newton. That nature is not an inert, lifeless, deterministic machine, that there are stochastic properties as quantum mechanics uh, has revealed, um, uh, uh, levels of indeterminacy in matter itself that I believe is evidence for an innate uh, creativity, uh, call it uh, an element of, of mentality, some, 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 something that is uh, structured novelty um, that creates uh, new patterns through process that we could not get from a Newtonian type of machine. Um, and, and that's the lesson that I've been given that I've gleaned from quantum mechanics and, and Gödel and, uh, and, and uh, Heisenberg. Yeah. Would it just be more technical question to say that it would be illogical to go outside of our of nature and outside of time and space to some other entity where things that we are in will accept that there is no such thing as this other world sense based upon this that it does make sense to go outside of our And 
and you had, I don't see how talking about things happening by chance in quantum physics, if that's indeed what quantum physics proves, which I would disagree with. Uh, I don't see why things happening randomly has anything to do with, with people making choices, unless the point is that the choices are completely random, arbitrary events that have no connection with motives or, or goals or anything of the sort. reasoning, the fact that we have a bunch of dots, and the fact that there are some dots that are missing, doesn't mean that those dots will not be filled in and a line can be drawn forming a continuity of evolution. It just means that, uh, that those things haven't been discovered. I disagree with one of my students at Utah Valley State College that informed our class that fossils in the bottom of the Grand Canyon were put there by Satan to um, to test our faith, I I, I don't I, I believe that um, that that they were uh, that they're remnants of life forms that existed millions of years ago, and that we have a record of them. Or uh, This will be an open question to either or both of you to take. I'm, I'm going to just touch on something that uh, David already brought before, and it's a matter of deism as a solution to reconcile uh, traditional philosophical limitations of an Abrahamic God, for example, free will versus determinate, determination. Um, there's, there's a number of how, how can you reconcile omniscience, omnipotence, and some of these things. But nonetheless, in order to address some of the valid reasons for a supernatural force, also to address things that may seem self-evident in the human experience, such as art, beauty, transcendence, poetry, um, idealism, uh, in, in a sense to reach for something larger than ourselves than secular humanism may seem to offer the human emotional 